Welcome to the series of Global Governance. Today we are going to discuss the challenges to uh, security and stability in the region of the Black Sea. Very challenging region, traditionally very challenging, with uh, <clears throat> different geopolitical, geographical challenges. So, and today I am pleased to <clears throat> uh, introduce our two uh, panelists. <clears throat> Very important panelist. <coughs> First of all, Ambassador of Bulgaria, Georgi Velikov Panayot. <coughs> good afternoon. Good, good friend uh, and a very active ambassador in the United Nations. What is a very important <coughs> his experience. He served for several years in Afghanistan. Wow, <coughs> in a very crucial year. So that's why if you move out the uh, Black Sea, he's the best expert on that. Well, <coughs> Uh, but at any rate, he's an expert on the region <coughs> he's originating from. He knows everything about the challenges uh, which are both military, both <coughs> political, both economic, energy challenges. So we are going to speak about all of them. And <coughs> my good compatriot, uh, General <coughs> Yuri Kravitz, <coughs> who has recently <coughs> joined the Ukrainian mission to the United Nations. He's the head of the Ukrainian military mission to the United Nations. Previously to that, he was <coughs> air, um, military air attaché in Washington. So <coughs> he knows everything about the military component of the challenges in the Black Sea with all recent developments. And so we count on him to share with us on, <coughs> on what is going on, balances, checks and balances, <coughs> disbalances uh, <coughs> in the region. So with that, <coughs> uh, because people will come in uh, <coughs> from anywhere, uh, we, uh, we have a web coverage, <coughs> as always. So that's why uh, all the Ivy League universities will uh, have a <coughs> chance to observe all your questions, the answers. And with that, I would like to <coughs> ask Ambassador Panyotov <coughs> to, to start our discussion and to make, to make his presentation. <coughs> Well, <coughs> um, if you need that. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you for taking your time. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for this kind uh, introduction. Um, I would like to stress that uh, Besides having spent five years of my life in Afghanistan as a deputy chief of mission at the Bulgarian embassy there, uh, I used to head uh, our NATO department back home at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and uh, I dealt uh, in details uh, with uh, the security in the so-called broader Black Sea region. Uh, today I'm going uh, to focus my presentation exactly on that. You are very well aware of the geographical location of the Black Sea region. Oops, this doesn't work. Okay, oops, here we are. <laughs> here we are. But uh, nevertheless, I prepared uh, this uh, slide. Uh, immediately, I would like to correct the map because the capital of Ukraine in Ukrainian language is not being spelled like Kiev, but in, like Kiev. So uh, this on the map is wrong. And uh, here we have a country which is called Macedonia, which is not exactly correct, as you know, due to the agreement signed in Prespa between Greece and North Macedonia, the latter uh, changed its name because uh, this was uh, the way uh, for the authorities in North Macedonia to clear their path to Brussels, that is to say uh, to the uh, integration into the European Union and to the Euro-Atlantic integration, that is to say to NATO. The Black Sea region. Why we are talking today about the Black Sea region? I'm not going to read from the slides, but uh, it is central 
that this region first has been for a very long time not in the center of the attention of the Euro-Atlantic institutions. Why? Because immediately after the fall of the Soviet Union, the Turkish fleet, Turkey is a NATO member state and has the second biggest army in NATO, the Turkish fleet actually was superseding the Black Sea fleet of the Soviet Union. Now, we'll go back to the slide. No, sorry for that. Yeah, here. And I'll come closer to the map. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. First of all, let's have a closer look at what are the Black Sea littoral states. We have three NATO member states, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey. As I mentioned, Turkey has the second biggest ar army in NATO. Very important ally, a key ally. Bulgaria, Romania. Bulgaria and Romania at the same time are EU member states. Turkey is not. Turkey is an aspirant country. They are negotiating their EU membership. We have Ukraine. We have Russia. We have Georgia. Here is Crimea, which now has been occupied by the Russian Federation. Part of Georgia, this map is not correct uh, in this, again, probably I have uh, to choose another one, map, whatever. Uh, here we have two republics which have been recognized only by the Russian Federation, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. After, as a result of the Russian-Georgian war, Georgia lost those territories and South Ossetia and Abkhazia are independent, that is to say, totally under Russian control because nobody else recognizes them. This country is central and I will tell you why I think so. The Black Sea is a very important intersection because it is a communication, transportation and energy corridor in two directions, west, east and north, south. The Black Sea gives Russia the possibility to jump into the regions of the Eastern Mediterranean, to project its influence on the Balkans, in Caucasus, as well as in the Northern Middle East. All post-Soviet conflicts, I'll go back to the slide with the map. The map is loading slowly. All the post-Soviet protracted conflicts in Moldova, Transnistria. Here, as I mentioned, North uh, uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Eastern Ukraine and now the occupied Crimea. They are all concentrated around the Black Sea. Black Sea for Russia, traditionally, historically, was the way out to an open sea, to the Medi Mediterranean. It was Russian ambitions in centuries to control the Straits, the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles, or like the Turks uh, called them, the Turkish Straits. I see somebody was laughing, but uh, the name of the Straits actually was a very important uh, uh, point of dispute within NATO between uh, Turkey and uh, the other member states. But I call them Bosphorus and the Dardanelles. Just a couple of years ago, 
Russia tried to gain control over a naval base in Montenegro, here in Podgorica. That has been denied by the Montenegrin authorities. We all know that now Russia has a naval base in the Mediterranean, Tartus, in Syria. So, Russia's ambitions were to control the straits, so to secure the link of the closed Black Sea to the Mediterranean and later to the World Sea, to the ocean. And as I mentioned, the Black Sea is a very important intersection of energy corridors. Back to the slide. There are several energy corridors already in place. The first one is the so-called Blue Stream, connecting Russia with the, this part of Turkey. Another one, the Turkish stream, is connecting Russia with the European part of Turkey, not far away from Istanbul. There is another oil pipeline, because the first two are gas pipelines. There is a third pipeline called ba baku Jehan, going from Baku in Azerbaijan through Georgia, bypassing Armenia to the port of Jehan, which is on the Mediterranean. These two corridors, first the Blue Stream and the second, the Turkish Stream, are doing what? They are bypassing this territory, Ukraine. On Ukrainian territory, there is a gas pipeline called Druzhba. The Russians just want to bypass Ukraine and to marginalize the importance of Ukraine in the energy trade in Europe. Last year, in 2018, despite the efforts of the European Commission, Russia transported record amount of gas to Europe, using, including these gas pipelines here. And they are building another pipeline, which is called Nord Stream, going directly to Germany, that one, the Nord Stream, is bypassing Poland. So, as you can see, Russia is using energy as a policy leverage, as a leverage in its foreign policy. But this is part of the reality. The other part of the reality is that Russia is using not only energy, Russia is using also corruption, Russia is using rivalries within the Euro European Union and within the allies within NATO in order to split them. Now, who are the main players when we are talking about the security of the Black Sea region? First of all, NATO. As you know, NATO is the most successful political military, military alliance in the world, comprising uh, 29 states, USA, Canada, and 27 European states. NATO is an alliance, political military, I would like to stress that, not only military, because if Article 5 is the backbone of the alliance, that is that the attack against one would be an attack against all, then Article 4, which talks about negotiations and consultations, it is its soul. So, NATO has a key role in the security around Black Sea, but at the same time, 
that role is limited. Why? Because we have the Montreal Convention. According to the Montreal Convention, that is an international uh, document, no foreign vessel, military vessel, has the right to stay in the Black Sea more than 45 days if that vessel does not belong to any of the littoral countries, littoral states. That is to say, if a US, Canadian, Spanish, UK military ship would like to enter uh, Black Sea, first, it requires the permission of Turkey, and it cannot spend more than 45 days in the Black Sea. So NATO has to think out of the box what to do. Just recently, during the NATO ministerial in, held in Washington, D.C., the NATO ministers agreed a package of measures to improve NATO's situational awareness in the Black Sea region and strengthen support for partners Georgia and Ukraine. Once again, the alliance has to find a way how to best do that because the Montreal Convention is practically prohibiting that, is not allowing it. And NATO is important because NATO is the organization with hard military infrastructure and hard military capabilities. The other player, the European Union, doesn't have any hard military capabilities. European Union has not been designed to be a defense alliance. The European Union has soft security power. European Union is very solid when it comes to development, when it comes to human rights, when it comes to humanitarian aid, but the European Union is still a dwarf when it comes to military power. Although most of the European countries are NATO members. The European Union has an instrument called Eastern Partnership with the participation of Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, Romania, Azerbaijan and Belarus. All but Belarus are part of the so-called broader Black Sea area. And this instrument aims at building a common area of democracy, prosperity, stability and cooperation. We are trying to solidify democracy in those countries, to make them partners and to try to avoid conflicts. But still, the mediation, the role of the European Union as a mediator is limited. You can read that in the, its global strategy in 2016, the Union uh, described, defined, identified the conflicts in the Black Sea region as a challenge to the European security order. Identifying is one thing, doing something about is completely other thing. The European Union lacks the tools to do that. That's why I placed NATO in the first place. Another player, uh, of course, are the United States of America, traditionally involved in European developments since World War I, but more significantly after the Second World War. The United States are a leading country in NATO. Actually, the alliance uh, is the most powerful political military alliance because of the unique military capabilities of the United States of America. The European countries are lagging behind in technology and military cap uh, capabilities from the United States of America. Now they are trying to uh, close that gap, but it will take a lot of time. It will take uh, a lot of investment and it will take a lot of political will which right now in Europe it co is concentrated somewhere else. 
I'll come to that later. Russia. I told you it has been historically Russian foreign policy goal to control the straits of the Black Sea. That's why they had several wars with Turkey. At the time, the both countries were empires. Actually, as a result of one of those wars, Bulgaria regained its independence. But uh, it was not uh, the main goal of Russia to liberate Bulgaria. It was Russia's goal to uh, put the straits under control. Nevertheless, we regained our independence. We, we are grateful for that. Turkey. I talked very much about NATO, why I singled out Turkey. Because Turkey is a very specific case. You know it that right now there is a deepening tension between Turkey and the leading country in NATO, the United States, over the desire of Turkey to purchase Russian-made systems, C-400. The United States and, frankly, all the other allies are convinced that this is against the very spirit of the alliance to buy weapons from your adversary. Because NATO, at the end of the day, was created to counter the aspirations of the Soviet Union in Europe. And now, one of the most important allies, Turkey, is trying, is not trying, they signed a deal to purchase very sophisticated anti-aircraft systems called C-400. Turkey is a very ambitious country, uh, especially under President Erdogan. It's a very big country. It has very strategic location between Europe and Asia. It has a uh, demographic boom. It has over 80 million uh, people. The population of Turkey is over 80 million. Turkey, Turkey's ambitions are to be a regional leader, to dominate the region. And of course, it's their right uh, to have such ambitions. They also would like, I think, to dominate the Shia world. Not only the region, but to dominate the Shia world. Why? Because in the times of the Ottoman Empire, a very large part of the Shia world is actually part of that empire. They have historic connections. They have uh, um, the tradition. They have the faith. Um, they have, uh, in, many, in many cases, uh, the, the same history, same past, and same present, because uh, the Arab countries are one of the main uh, trade partners of Turkey nowadays. And now I have two players with question marks. First is the OEC, and the second is China. Why question marks? Because OEC, before the Ukrainian conflict, conflict, was practically an organization in decline, marginalized organization. The OEC has been created during this, the Cold War to be the bridge between the East and the West, to be uh, the round table for talks between the East and the West. With the fall of the Iron Curtain, uh, that role vanished to a greater extent. But with the Ukrainian conflict, conflict that role re-emerged again. OEC turned out to be the only organization to have some role in Ukraine, in eastern Ukraine. And still, the OEC mission in Ukraine as I put it here on the slide, is called Special Monitoring Mission in Ukraine. What do they do? They monitor. Yes, they meet uh, all the players there. They meet uh, the Russian side. They meet the Ukrainian side. 
they try to uh, be mediators, they try to avoid uh, escalation of the conflict, but still they are monitoring. There were ideas to start a UN mission in Ukraine. But the concept of Russia for UN mission and the concept of practically the rest of the world about that mission was totally different. Probably my Ukrainian colleagues will go deeper into that. And China, question mark. Is China a player in the European security in general and in the security of Black Sea region? I don't know. But I know that China is the only country in the world which has a global strategy. Neither the European Union has a global strategy. Although there is uh, on this slide the 2016 EU's global strategy, but uh, it encounters uh, a lot of challenges. The USA right now, does the United States have a global strategy? I don't think so. Does Russia have a global strategy? I don't think so. So China is the only country in the world with a global strategy. They have that very interesting project, the Belt and Road Initiative, the Chinese. The, Bo the Belt and Road, Road Initiative uh, is a project which actually promotes the connection between China and the West. But that is connected to another thing, heavy Chinese investment in critical infrastructure everywhere on the road. And the recent experience from the results of those efforts of Beijing in some countries like uh, Sri Lanka, for example, is very negative. Nevertheless, one EU member state, Italy, recently declared that it will participate in that project. The European Union, as such, in my country as well, we said no. But Italy agreed, and right now, together with the Chinese, they are going to build a port in the Mediterranean, I think in the town of Trieste. So still, I'm not quite sure whether China is a player in the security and stability of the Black Sea region, but it certainly would have such ambitions in near future. Here, I prepared a list of the Russia's Black Sea fleet, but I'm not going to elaborate on the sub submarine ships and boats. The more important thing is that in the 2015 Maritime Doctrine of the Russian Federation, the Russian Black Sea fleet has one major task. And that is to ensure Russian sovereignty over Crimea. Russia nowadays has very sophisticated military capabilities in the Black Sea, thanks to its occupation of Crimea. Crimea is like second Kaliningrad, second Königsberg. It's the largest aircraft carrier in the world. A2AD, this is a military jargon, probably the, the general I'm sure knows about it, probably most of you do, but uh, uh, A2AD stands for anti-access area denial. That is to say that in Crimea, 
and not only, but mainly in Crimea. Russian military possesses long-range anti-air and anti-ship systems and sensor systems which cover virtually all of the Black Sea. They have uh, aircrafts and those aircrafts, both fighters and fighter bombers, play power projection role. Their electronic warfare potential is very up-to-date and as I already mentioned, the Russian Black Sea Fleet is actually the muscles for Russian power projection in the Eastern Mediterranean. Why A2AD? By possessing such capabilities, Russia practically controls and is capable to hit, that is to say to destroy, everything what moves in the Black Sea, including vessels and aircrafts of NATO member states. That is why the North Atlantic Treaty Organization has to find a way how to increase its presence in the Black Sea and to help the partners Georgia and Ukraine. It will not be easy. Here I came to the main challenges, which you can read from the screen. It's clear that the center of gravity in the world is shifting and the direction is from west to east. Make no mistake, it is not vice versa, it is from west to east. Europe. What is now the condition of Europe? Brexit immigration, we have uh, emerging non-liberal democracies, that's a new term, relatively, for Europe I mean, but we have emerging non-liberal democracies in Europe, I mean EU member states. The Brits are still thinking what to do with uh, their decision to leave the European Union. They practically are sailing uncharted waters. They don't know what to do and nobody knows because it's happening for the first time. But it's very painful for both the UK and the rest of Europe. And Russia's ev evolving resurgence just years ago, we have been talking about uh, Russia's resurgence. It continues. That's uh, an ongoing process. Needless to say uh, what the Mueller report uh, was about. Needless to say uh, that uh, it has been proved that if not the Russian government, but hackers somewhere in Russia caused disruption of the Estonian bank system years ago. That's why in Estonia now we have uh, uh, cyber uh, center which is designed to counter uh, cyber, thre cyber threats. And uh, once again Russia is using everything it can in order to promote its interest. Everything on the book, everything, especially energy. There is another challenge here. I permitted myself to put it here because I believe in it. The US foreign policy, its future is uncertain. In the last couple of years, there were a lot of statements coming from the U.S. administration. And good part of them were not very nice about America's allies. That includes my country. Not particularly that nobody talked about Bulgaria, but European Union, NATO, it is true that America 
America's burden is the heaviest in NATO. That is without any doubt. But it has been decided in, during the times of the former administration that all the other allies, that was the NATO summit in Wales, that all the other allies will increase their uh, expenses for military purposes to up to 2% of their GDPs. And we're doing that, including my country. And even the slightest signals from Washington is very painful for us. Because America is our strategic partner, they are the main ally. It was because of America and the West that Eastern Europe fought for freedom. Because freedom is not merely a word. I'm 50 years old, I lived under communism. Believe me, freedom is not merely a word. Freedom is much more than a word. Energy, insecurity, I touched upon that. And the internal challenges in every single country. We have rise of nationalism. We have rise of populism, which is not helpful at the moment. So, I'm done with the presentation and I'm ready to answer your question. What we will do? We will have <coughs> okay. All right. presentation of the general and then, <coughs> and then we come to the, All right. to the question. So, you so. can take this. This is yours. Thank Where is you. yours? So, thank you thank very you. much for your attention once again. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Ambassador Panayotov. Thank you, uh, Georgi, for a comprehensive presentation. You touch upon practically all the major issues and challenges. Now I'm uh, putting the new, uh, the new slides for the next presentation uh, here. Thank you. We'll come back to the, uh, the major players in the, in the region. Uh, uh, you mentioned all of them, Russia, Turkey, uh, NATO. It's here. It is here. Well. <clears throat> now, General Kravitz, you you have you have floor. Well, thank you. From the table. No, I'll, I'll oh, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen. It's, uh, first of all, I'd like to express my gratitude for this opportunity to be with, uh, with you at this renowned institution. And uh, I see it, it is, is my task to share with you the previous one. And the previous one. The very beginning. Previous, the Malenko snail. Yeah, I'd like to share with you some thoughts about the ongoing aggression, uh, Russian ag military aggression to my country, and to take up at the that military aggression against against Ukraine is a vivid demonstration of the Russian overall challenge to peace and stability in Eastern Europe. Uh, I would like to stick to the and concentrate my remarks to the military instrument of power, which Russia rather skillfully uses against my country. Uh, I would like, from, from the outset, I'd like to emphasize that those who has to deal with Russia will usually face a dilemma of what to believe, to believe in what Russia says or in what Russia does. Have a look, please, at, at, at that slide. On the one hand, you could, you could probably have heard that the chief of the Russian Armed Forces General Staff, General Valery Gerasimov, made several interesting statements in the 
in, in a speech at the Russian Academy of Military Sciences on March the 2nd, 2019. And I'll read them for you. The Pentagon has started developing a completely new strategy of military action, which has already been Christian the Trojan horse. Its, its essence lies in the active use of the fifth column protest potential to destabilize the situation along with simultaneous precision strikes on the most important targets. The United States and its allies are developing offensive military actions such as a global strike and multi-domain battle and are using the technologies of color revolution and soft power. And the US goal is the liquidation of the statehood of undesirable countries. Do we have to believe in those words? Or we have to judge Russia's international policy upon its deeds, say in Georgia in 2008, or nowadays Ukraine, Syria, or probably Venezuela? Did I press something? Oh. Well, <laughs> probably. Does it work? Okay. In essence, next slide, please. In essence, as we see it, Russia tries to create new tension zones in Europe and in the, in the Mediterranean in order to arrange the existing system of international relations so that Moscow could regain the role of some dominant power, which is crucial to the very sustainability of Putin's regime inside Russia itself. Acting that way, Kremlin is counting on getting new spheres of influence as well as on the restoration of control over the post-Soviet states or over what in the Russian parlance is called near abroad. One of the main instruments which Russia, Russia uses to this end is its armed forces. And in some sense, I would argue that Mr. Putin, during all this time in power, has spared no effort in reviving the Russian military might, sincerely believing in what he, in April 2015, said to the Russian population in a televised address when he referred to some adage attributed to the Russian Emperor Alexander III, who once said that Russia has just only two allies, its army and its navy. Next slide, please. <laughs> by widening the geography and scale of its military engagements, Russia, by putting boots on the ground, creates new political realities on the ground, trying to achieve Kremlin's geopolitical objectives. And we can trace evolution of the Russian geopolitical ambitions through the evolution of the Russian armed forces. Generally speaking, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Russian armed forces operationally evolved through the following stages. From quasi peacekeeping operations of the Russian military after the collapse of the USSR in Transnistria, Abkhazia and Ossetia in 1991 until 1993, through two Chechen wars inside Russia in 1994, 1996 and 1999 till 2020, 2000, respectively, to the offensive operations of the Russian military in the, the so-called near abroad in Georgia in 2008 and in Ukraine since 2014, and the offensive operation of the Russian military in the far abroad, for instance, in Syria, which has been ongoing since 2015. Next slide, please. In a wider perspective, what we, as the military, see at present is that Russia prepares for a full-scale war by modernizing its strategic nuclear forces in order to increase their capability of penetrating missile defenses, by creating strategic non-nuclear forces, by creating self-sufficient inter-service groupings in the northwest, western, southwestern, and eastern regions. Russia increased, is increasing the scale and intensity of operational and mobilization training. It creates a single national echelon air and missile defense system and it employs non-linear warfare methods. It also creates a strategic electronic warfare, uh, electronic warfare systems, and it implements the concept of expeditionary forces, power projection in distant territories. And finally, as we believe, Russia is preparing its economy to function at the time of war. This is an overall context. Next slide. Whereas the context of my country, I would say, Russia continues to amass its conventional troops near the state border almost all around Ukraine, creating really real military threats to my country. And the situation is extremely unfavorable for my NATO land since the Kremlin has already got a real opportunity to launch an open armed aggression inside Ukraine without the need for additional redeployment of its armed forces 
from other parts of Russia. In fact, about 70% of the Ukrainian-Russian border, borders is a contact line with our military opponent. Such a situation allows Russia to carry out flank strikes simultaneously, as you can see in, in the slide, from three different directions. To this end, the Kremlin amassed along our mutual border is a grouping of military forces of about 88,000 troops and the, and the rest, you can see the numbers. And according to the plans of the Russian command until 2020, the strength of this grouping will increase by third. So if Russia starts its open aggression, the existing grouping of Russian forces will allow to get an access to the rear of our forces. It will cut off Ukraine from its western borders and thus from any military support from our NATO partners through those borders. Next slide, please. Since the 2014, the number of combat units in the border regions of Russia has more than tripled, including the formation of another combined arms army and motorized rifle division in its structure. In total, the number of infantry and tank regiments increased from 2 to 12, and during the next two years, we expect to see the deployment of the third combined arms army one more division, and at least four brigades and six regiments on the Ukrainian direction. Under such conditions, Russia is capable of launching, as I already said, in a sudden offensive against Ukraine without showing any sign of preparation, since some elements of the strike forces are already concentrated at a distance less than 50 kilometers from the border of Ukraine. In the course of such an offensive, both naval and ground-based cruise missiles, as well as strategic aviation, along with the combined arms armies, the conventional weaponry can be used. Next slide, please. And we shouldn't forget that the Russian military are already inside Ukraine, in the east of my country, where two army corps, one for Donetsk, another one for Lugansk region, are stationed. Those two army corps constitute the bulk of the Russian occupational force inside Ukraine. They have been created, they are manned, equipped, trained, and maintained under Russian templates, and they are under strict command and control of the Russian chain of command, going from the southern military district up to the Russian general staff in Moscow. So in other words, Russia has already created conditions for its long-term military presence in Ukraine. This is a more or less known fact. Next slide, please. What is less known, though, is that those two army corps are part and parcel of the Russian Joint Task Force created in the southern military district, and the commander of the 8th Army of the military district is dual headed it, being also a commander of the Joint Task Force, which is to operate on the so-called Dawn Operational Direction within Southwestern Strategic Direction in the Russian military parlance. In practical, mean, in practical terms, for the Russian military, it means that the occupied part of Donbass area of Ukraine is already part of the geography of the Southern Military District and a part of that Ukrainian Russian border, which we do not control because of the occupation, is non-existent for the Russians for all intents and purposes. These are the facts which Russians try hard to conceal. Otherwise, all Russian propaganda phraseology about some Donbass people raising their arms against the Kievan junta would lose its appeal. Next slide, please. As I already mentioned, Russia would probably use both naval and ground-based cruise missiles as well as strategic aviation in its inventory when, when and if it decides to launch an open offensive against Ukraine. We believe so because Russia continues to enlarge a pool of carriers of high-precision weaponry such as ground and naval-based cruise missiles. For instance, the current concept of the development of the armed forces of Russia stipulates that each combined arms army or army corps of the ground forces should have a unit of Iskander in NATO uh, designation SS-26 stone mobile short-range ballistic missile system in its structure. We know that in December 2018, the formation of 72nd separate battalion of Iskandar short-range ballistic missile system in the structure of the 8th Army of the Southern Military District started. It is planned that the missile brigade will be created in due time in its stead. Similar measures are expected to be implemented in the structure of the 22nd Army Corps, which integrates all Russian ground forces and the occupied Crimea. The high command of the armed forces of Russia is in dead earnest about getting by the year 2021 an increase in the number of carriers of cruise missiles around the border of Ukraine in two times and number of missiles into 2.4 times. 
Next slide, please. And here you can see that the, the, the deployment of the Black Sea fleet of Russian new combat ships with caliber land attack cruise missiles is underway. And at present, the Black Sea fleet boasts of five Buyan M class cruise missile corvettes and six improved kilo diesel submarines. Those combat ships with caliber land attack cruise missiles regularly perform combat missions in the Eastern Mediterranean near Syria. Next slide. On the other hand, Russia continues to modernize its airspace forces by equipping them with modern aircraft and improving the airdrome network. New Russian strike planes have an extended range, and as you can see, new Suhoi 30SM and Suhoi 34 planes are capable of using onboard weapons at the targets of Central European states. And long range strategic launchers, launchers bombers, Tupolev 160, and Tupelo 95 MS and Tupelo 22 M3 in non-nuclear equipment, may be also used together with tactical aircraft. In the second half of the 2018, we noticed an increase by 30% compared to the same period of 2017 of the intensity of flights of Russian operational and tactical aviation of both Western and Southern military districts. Next slide, please. Overall, Generally speaking, special attention should be paid to the fact that Russia uses the Black Sea region as a springboard for proliferation of Russian influence to the Mediterranean, which uh, the Excellency already alluded to. And uh, while the objectives of Moscow in the Black Sea region are as follows, as we see it, not to let the return of Crimea under Ukrainian jurisdiction, to gain full control over the Black Sea with the goal to influence the states of the region and to counterbalance any U.S.-NATO actions in the alliance's eastern flank, and provide for constant Russian military presence in the Mediterranean. Next slide. In this regard, we should remember that on December 17, 2018, the U.N. General Assembly adopted the resolution named on the issue of militarization of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and Sevastopol, and parts of Black and Azov Seas, in which the U.N. urges Russia to withdraw its armed forces from Ch Crimea expresses grave concern over its mounting military presence and urges Russia to stop its illegal occupation of the part of the territory of Ukraine. However, in violation of international laws, Russia continues to the militarization of the Crimea. The Russian Minister of Defense conducts large-scale exercise of airborne forces in the temporary occupied Crimea, including training of, of deployment nuclear weapons on the territory of temporary occupied Crimea and preparing them for combat use. Russian Defense Minister Shoigu stated once that Russia has enhanced combined and control structures in occupied Crimea. In, its, in his turn, the chairman of Russia's State Duma Defense Committee, Shamano, Shamano, recently stated that Russian Tupolev 22M3 strategic bombers were deployed in occupied Crimea. According to, to Shamano, those the missile aircraft underwent deep modernization and are capable of destroying any target in Europe. Head of the Defense and Security Committee of the Russian Federation Council, Bondarev, also added that Russia Crimea deployed Iskander mobile short-range ballistic missiles on the peninsula. He also emphasized that Tupolev 22 M3 bombers and cruise missiles can hit any spot in Europe and can destroy any element of the enemy's missile or, or air defenses. By his words, further modernization of Tupolev 22M3 bombers with the installation of the new types of ammunition will make the bomber a universal means for airstrikes at all types of targets at the range of thousands of kilometers. And in this case, I think, we shouldn't miss the point in their boastful assertions. Should work. Okay, next slide. Another direction of Kremlin's aggressive actions with the Ukraine is the Russian try to acquire full control over the Sea of Azov. And underlying aims behind the Russian efforts to control the Sea of Azov are as follows. First, to revise Russian-Ukrainian borders after annexation of Crimea. To acquire full control over the Sea of Azov and the Kerch Strait. To block the Ukrainian economic activity in the region. And by doing so, to create depression zones in the coastal area of the Sea of Azov and provoke socio, social economic instability and bring pro-Russian political forces back to power in the region. And finally, to pressure Ukraine to restore water supply to occupied Crimea. 
Next slide, please. And there is a history behind Russia's current malign efforts regarding the Sea of Azov. We should go back to 2003 when Russia tried to erect the dam to the Ukrainian Tuzla Island, and by doing so, they tried, they tried to impose the new borders in the Sea of Azov. At that time, under Russian pressure, Ukraine was forced to conclude the agreement about common usage of the Sea of Azov, which in fact removed the waters of the Sea of Azov and catch right from jurisdiction of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea of 1982. Next slide, please. Relying upon the above mentioned treaty in 2008, Russian Ukrainian Commission signed a protocol determining median line of the Sea of Azov, according to which 62% of its water area shall belong to Ukraine. However, Russia at present rejects that agreement and demonstrates no intention to complete the limitation of Ukrainian Russian maritime border. Next slide. Here, here you can see the Sea of Azov water delimitation schema, which Russia tries to impose on Ukraine under which our state will con control only a belt of coastal waters, not more than 12 miles wide. Next slide, please. Since April 2018, Russian Navy has been conducting different actions for impeding freedom of navigation and blockade of Ukrainian ports of Mariupol and Berdyansk in the Sea of Azov by closing certain areas of the Sea of Azov under pretext of Russian naval exercises. Long-term delay of passage of commercial vessels which are headed to or from Ukrainian ports as a result of intensive inspection by Russian security forces became a common practice. The specific attention Russian security forces pay to vessels with Ukrainian crew members. Next slide, please. I would like to have your attention to the design features of the Crimean, Crimean Bridge, which additionally limits the passage of vessels to the Sea of Azov. Headroom of Crimean Bridge for vessels movement is 35 meters, nav nav navigable depth 9 meters. As a result of these design features, maximum air draught of vessels moving in the Sea of Azov limited by 33 meters and water draught by 8 meters. Next slide, please. Such Russian actions led to, is leading to economic losses of Ukraine through contraction of income of southern regions of Ukraine specifically in the spheres of maritime transfers, trade, industry, and fishing. It has already caused curtailment of cargo traffic of port of Mariupol by 20%, Berdyansk by 43%, and reduced fishing in the Sea of Azov by 50%. Delays in cargo traffic results in worsening of situation in metallurgical industry and reducing size of steel export, which is one of the main sources of hard currency to the state budget. For you to understand, a part of metallurgical industry products in, in the structure of Ukraine export is near 25%. It's about 10 billion US dollars. Next slide, please. There is one more thing Russia is after in this year of Azov. I'd love, it'd love to start extraction of oil and gas resources in Azov Berezhansky and Indolo Kubansky fields. Estimated oil and gas stocks in this year of Azov are equivalent to 413 million tons of oil. Next slide, please. And also see that Russia boosted its activity in the northwestern part of the Black Sea, which includes beefing up the protection of the seized Ukrainian drill platforms, more intensive ISR operations, as well as imposing stricter control of maritime navigation by declaring from time to time, under the pretext of naval exercises, closed areas near navigation routes. For instance, in August 2018, the Russian Black Sea fleet conducted a naval exercise in the northwestern part of the Black Sea with practice launches of caliber, caliber sea-based cruise missiles and live artillery fire. For us, it means that in Crimea, as well as in Kaliningrad region, Russia is creating new ge geostrategic nodes within its global country NATO framework. And composition of Russian forces, weapons, and munitions already deployed in Crimea indicate that Russian military is preparing for combat in the Black Sea theater of operations with the use of its most sophisticated conventional weaponry and ISR assets. Next slide, please. Distinguished colleagues, to conclude, I would like to emphasize that people of Ukraine should be proud of the Ukrainian army, which stood up to the Russian military encroaches inside Ukraine. And there is a, a growing consensus in Ukraine that there is no military way to rid of the Russian occupation and that only political and diplomatic actions should be used. This is where the UN should step in, but it's a separate topic of discussion. 
In this regard, I would only reiterate that the Ukrainian government supports further implementation of the Minsk Agreement for peaceful settlement of conflict in the Donbas and uses any opportunity to call on Russia to stop its aggression against Ukraine, to return the next Crimea, immediately release Ukrainian sailors, vessels, and equipment unlawfully captured in the Black Sea on 25th of November 2018 and restore freedom of shipping through the Kerch Strait and the Sea of Azov. And by this, I conclude my, my presentation. You. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you indeed. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> uh, we'll start now for question and answers. Uh, thank you to, um, to both of our uh, panelists for comprehensive explanation of what's going on. Uh, so, several uh, dimensions of the challenges so we, <coughs> we had in front of us to discuss. First of all, military political. So, <coughs> Ambassador and the General explained us <coughs> uh, what's going on there. Um, I will, I will start with my questions and uh, leave uh, the questions to uh, to the uh, <coughs> uh, to August audience, audience. Well, to you. Mm. Uh, so it is it is clear that the main challenge now in the uh, political military challenge and dramatic uh, changes in the geostrategic <coughs> situation in in uh, Black Sea uh, happened after the annexation of Crimea. Russia got the platform uh, to, to perform from this platform, as it was um, demonstrated in the slides that for the first time from this platform, uh, uh, Russia attacked uh, Georgia in 2008, having uh, the naval base in Sevastopol. And then, uh, first uh, ever after the collapse of the Soviet Union, when Russia uh, performed outside in Syria. So before that, it was Afghanistan. It was, it was well demonstrated. So uh, mm, it is clear that Russia is trying to uh, return, its, uh, ret return the position of the Soviet Union and to control us this, all this region and to recreate the, mm, the perimeter of their own security and to create the buffer zones <coughs> around herself and then to, to play a role of the regional leader. So mm, their tactics if not a strategy, I agree with Ambassador that <coughs> uh, it is very difficult to define the strategy what Russia has in mind <coughs> uh, globally, just to keep uh, floating as the uh, global leader, creating uh, global crises and then to demand uh, to recognize their global role. But it is clear that in the region they are uh, trying to, uh, to return its influence, to control mm, uh, uh, the periphery of uh, interest. Uh, they are doing that uh, through destabilizing of Ukraine. It is clear, and they keep destabilizing of Ukraine. It is clear that mm, they are paralyzing Moldova, uh, keeping uh, uh, the, mm, uh, the proxies, army proxies in Transnistria. It is clear that they, uh, they are subduing Georgia, very clear. Uh, supporting different political forces there and trying to put them in their orbit. It is clear that they are trying to isolate Romania. Romania is one of the uh, um, close partners of, uh, of NATO in the region. Uh, it is clear. Uh, most probably Ambassador will um, uh, make a clear picture, but from my point of view that Russia is trying to neutralize Bulgaria through different means to interfere in domestic political affairs or something. And what is clear from the ambassador's presentation about the uh, particularly uh, energy insecurity, uh, uh, energy um, policy which Russia is playing. They're playing well to attract attention of such countries as Turkey, who is looking uh, their uh, own uh, leading role there, is through that uh, mechanism to pacify Turkey to pacify Turkey, not to, uh, not to play uh, the leading role um, in the NATO community in the, in, 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 in the region. Uh, but the question is that if to compare the budgets, United States has, uh, the military budget of the United States is more than seven uh, uh, hundred billion, uh, trillions, not billions, uh, dollars close to one trillion. 
Chinese budget is 244 billion. Russia budget is only 44 billion. But still they are <coughs> uh, trying to, to play a role of the, as the biggest uh, military uh, power in the world with 44 billion. <coughs> uh, the combined budget of all the littoral states in the Black Sea is <coughs> many times less than Russian budget. My first question is, <coughs> what are the means that should be taken to deter Russia? To deter Russia. <coughs> Because now it looks like the main military political uh, challenge in the region. But how to deter? <laughs> very easy question. Uh, very, yeah. very easy question. I do agree. Asking questions is always easy. Uh, but uh, you said it. You said it all, Yuri. Uh, in the sense that, that uh, Russia is cooperating very closely with Turkey. And they are cooperating not only in the energy sector, they are cooperating to uh, gas pipelines built already. Uh, the second inaugurated uh, with the participation of President Putin uh, in Turkey. And uh, uh, they also have uh, military cooperation as well. And I'm not envisaging only the uh, desire of Turkey to purchase that um, sophisticated C-400 system. Uh, I am envisaging their cooperation in Syria as well. So, how can we deter Russia? First of all, we have to solidify our ranks. Mm -hmm. Not to allow, uh, to allow Russia to split them, to uh, play... Um, individually with us and this goes uh, for NATO members this goes for EU members as well and what is the most important thing I mean how to solidify our ranks uh, is very complicated question by itself uh, but uh, we just have to stick to our values we have to stick to our val values because uh, what is the, the biggest difference, difference between uh, EU, NATO uh, and Russia are the values. I agree with the last, <coughs> last point that <coughs> after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the liberal world based on the values <coughs> started to decline. Interest, mm. interest uh, started to, <coughs> to prevail. So <coughs> that's why uh, the former uh, rivals from the liberal world, they are easily investing in a liberal world. Uh, uh, Non-communist or anti-communist countries investing in the communist countries, so values disappeared. And so now we are to, uh, to, to review what our, our values are. I agree with that. So, so this is a complicated, <coughs> complicated, complicated task. <coughs> uh, but Again, so the, uh, the military power of Russia is um, growing, as General demonstrated us in, in the region. So and, uh, what are the possibilities for the um, literal states to, um, well, at least to, uh, to reach the level of um, when they, um, they cannot, uh, um, not, not only to defend, but to deter? This is a question, um, and uh, not, not easy question. Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, for, first of all, I uh, I would agree with the, everything was said about the values, which uh, which means a lot in the in this should means should mean a lot in the, in this uh, in this time, because uh, alluding to uh, I mean trying to answer your previous question is for what can be done about the Russia's uh, intentions or actions. Uh, I would argue that uh, uh, first it should be a clear understanding of the threat, which uh, in, my, in my understanding is that Russia very skillfully switches from one, from using one uh, instrument of power, be it military in terms of 2008 in Georgia or 2014 in Ukraine, 
to economic pressure by, uh, by that oil, <coughs> pyrocarbonate uh, transportation issues, as uh, the ambassador alluded to, or uh, being it informational. We, we, we're very full aware of that the aptitude of the Russian propaganda, which uh, actually uh, has a, a good background in the Soviet, Soviet propaganda, since the, the mechanism and the people are, are there, so they, and they invest a lot of money. Uh, some say it's uh, roughly one, one billion to maybe more US dollars into the opera uh, operations in the, in the information era, information domain. It also applies to the uh, diplomatic efforts, which should be addressed. And I'm alluding to that very well known to the military dime, dime paradigm, which is those four, okay. four <coughs> instruments of power of every state, which can, it should be used to promote and to defend their issues. But on the other hand, when it comes to the, on the one side we have Russia alone, or trying to arrange some uh, some unions of, uh, of convenience with China or, with, or Turkey for this reason, or maybe Syria, Iran, even though they have a, a great uh, discrepancies as far as the different uh, policy, policy uh, issues. But they are unfortunately very, uh, very skillful in, in trying to get the, uh, the advantage of and trying to widen every fissure among the, the alliances. And so far they are very uh, successful in doing this in Europe. And even uh, uh, Ambassador alluded to the fact that non-liberal democracies, even though he, he didn't name the, those countries so everybody understand who, what are they. Yeah. But uh, they are there and they are very active against Ukrainian uh, values. And uh, even though I, I uh, I concentrate my my presentation on the military side of the dime paradigm. Uh, I didn't I didn't mean to uh, to say that Russia will attack Ukraine or further the NATO countries right away out in a matter of months or, or, or days. No, what I meant that they are preparing all their possibilities, their capabilities, refining their capabilities in all four four domains, mm -hmm. and so the response should be first as an alliance with those alliance of, uh, of uh, certain values. And we understand that the clash, even though it might be called Ukrainian conflict, it's a, we see it as a conflict of uh, intercivilizational because we are on the other part. We used to be part of the Soviet Union and now we understand what it means, what it meant to be on the opposite side when all the power of the propaganda, military might, economic pressure, just unleashed on your country as a matter of policy. And so, again, alliance with clear understanding and alliance of uh, values. This, this, this will be my response. Yeah, thank, thank you for that mm, and, and mentioning that mm, with this uh, uh, not big budget, 44 billion for Russia, of course they are looking for non-linear actions and mm, are not uh, symmetric actions. That's why they're using uh, information warfare, cyber warfare, whatever. And <clears throat> it, it, it demands from, uh, um, from, uh, from the liberal world, democratic world, to find the same, uh, the, the same actions, what to do. And that's why it's very important that you, <clears throat> you focus on the values. Values should, <clears throat> uh, should prevail in that, um, uh, in that competition. As it as it uh, did uh, as it did during the uh, the Cold War <coughs> confrontation and so on, when values gained, you have a question, please. The, this gentleman and then you. <coughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Ryan no. from the Jackson Institute again. It's an honor to have you here to speak with us today. Um, my question speaks to the per perception that potentially there's two separate strategies coming out of Russia. I'm uh, interested in your thoughts about how it seems their, their investment and their initiatives in the energy industry sometimes seem to counter uh, the initiatives they're taking in the asymmetric and nonlinear military world. What I mean by that is to say what we're seeing based on some of the military activity is some of the European nations diversifying their LPG reliance. For example, they're developing terminals in many of the states. 
because of their, uh, the discomfort with the pressure that Russia is placing on, on European nations. Meanwhile, um, they're, they're simultaneously developing uh, their energy sector at the same rate that they have in years, if not more so, as you previously stated. So I guess my question is, are those two things somehow synchronized together, or is it possible that there's two separate strategies coming out of two separate sectors from the Russian Federation? Hmm. You know? Yep. Well, uh, even though I'm not a, an expert in the, the energy wars, but uh, uh, my country was involved, so that we, we, we were made to become such such experts, and uh, I would argue that uh, I, uh, I see no discrepancies as far as the first. I would agree that uh, uh, there was mentioning uh, uh, mentioned that Putin's regime is, uh, has has no clear ma clear strategy uh, unless it's a strategy of opportunities. They they try to and some some call. Mr. Putin as a, an opportunist. It's right, right, rightly so. And uh, I, I would say that, again, uh, as we see it, the, the very regime, I mean, how they arranged uh, uh, Putin and, the, and the, all those around him is a sort of, we would call it as a, a sort of corporation, whereas the, uh, the leader is, uh, can allow some uh, 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 some vessels to uh, around him to uh, to use uh, to, to perform some projects, and you are responsible for this project. If you are successful, you are we are still in in the circle. If you are if you are not, you are out. So in some sense, you might have spotted the discrepancies of results of those who were involved in different projects, as I, I would argue that. Uh, uh, different uh, circles around Putin would be responsible for different actions, but the uh, the main underlying ground of those efforts of those efforts are the war. They are at war with the world. I mean, at least in the Western world, and that is why they they don't even they uh, as we call it in my country. You're trying to play by the rules in chess, but you play with uh, like baseball or something like. Very, very shooting range uh, with you. So they, they don't care about the values, even though they play the, the words with the values. So I would argue that what you have spotted is the discrepancies of different performances. But in, in, our, in, the, in general speaking, it's the same, the same the strategy of opportunities, trying to find every time they're trying to get an advantage to get uh, uh, advantage over in, in each and every situation. Even Ambassador uh, Sergei would uh, would probably uh, concur with me that even in the end, in the end, every time at every meeting in the end, if you have a Russian representative, what would he or she will be doing? She will, he or she will listen to everybody's speeches. And then we'll make a presentation, a statement of, of any sort. It should be, uh, but it should it should be there. They should pronounce anything that's opposite to any anybody, but that's their their the very presence. That's what, and the same they try apply to the all different operations. If the answer to your question, okay. You then you and the, and then to be the last. Yeah. <clears throat> Yes, thank you. Um, thanks uh, so much. Uh, Ambassador uh, Paniato, um, uh, abolishing the INF Treaty, uh, what do you think will mean for Bulgaria? And um, General Kravitz, um, you mentioned that Russia is preparing its economy for war. Um, I think this is an unfair question to you because you're in the military. What signs do you see for that? What are the symptoms of preparation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, the INF Treaty. It's clear that without the treaty, the risks are growing for Bulgaria. Not only for Bulgaria, for Europe. This treaty 
was designed as a guarantee for Europe mainly. And now we understand it's not going to be there anymore. We're not happy. We are very much concerned. We tried a lot to persuade our American allies and the Russian Federation to think twice. But the problem is that the Russian Federation did not comply with the treaty. And here it gets very complicated. Why? Because the, the essence of non-compliance with the treaty is top secret. And our American allies can share it with us only confidentially. So we are kind of blind here at the United Nations. We know that Russia, there, are there is evidence that Russia does not comply with the treaty, but at the same time, we don't know why. My colleagues at NATO know why. I here, let's say that officially don't know. <laughs> now, without the treaty, without the treaty, the risks are growing. And uh, at the end of the day, it is also true that the USA, America, is also interested to get out of the treaty. And not only because <coughs> of the Russian non-compliance, but because of developments in Asia. At the end of the day, as I said in my presentation, one of the main challenges, the center of gravity is shifting from west to east. Yeah. 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 By the way, I, I would agree with that, uh, with that uh, estimate as far as, because if there is no such a treaty, it, it would open up uh, the Pandora box of those countries who can have any missile production capability would come up with the effective missile uh, weaponry and uh, will threaten neighbors and will decide their problems with the, uh, well they will have an edge to decide on uh, with the weapon on one hand. And responding to your question as far as the how and what we, we see, uh, the question, the response is very, is very military. But that's what we saw, what we spot when we monitor the Russian training, strategic training exercises from year to year. And you know that every year Russia has its own strategic exercise. Even though it's uh, usually officially declared for a couple of weeks, in essence, it's an exercise which involves roughly one, at least two military districts with, uh, uh, with, with fleets, with uh, everything. And the last several exercises, strategic exercises, had as an agenda of uh, mastering their mobilization, mobilization and also the, the economy mobilization. They, they, try, they tried, at least it was vivid in 2018, last year exercise. It was a uh, Vostok 2018. Before that was Zapad. So it's a it's a new a new feature of their exercises, which they practice how the economy should be mobilized, and they and again what I'm trying to convey and uh, I I would give you an example, of an anecdote actually. It's uh, uh, on the one hand there is a uh, I referred already to that 8th Army. But again, why the name of the 8th Army? It's, and if you, find, if you look to the history, you, found, uh, you will find out that the 5th Army was created, actually was created in, in Russia, but it was re, uh, reformed in the eastern part of Ukraine and went through all the Second World War II to Berlin and it was a part of that occupying force, in, and then it was uh, taken again when, uh, after the reunification of Germany. It was disbanded, so it was formed again. 
And in the 20th Army, which is the Western Military District, there is a 144th Division, which is in close, now stationed in close proximity to Ukraine. It's some of the regiments is 25, uh, 30, 30 kilometers. Again, what's the name of it? It's the very division, the soldiers of which put up the so-called the flag, the banner of victory over Riksdag in, in Berlin. So in every, in every you know, political uh, indoctrination office, there is a saying, our ancestors did it, we would repeat it. That's for what they are doing. The, the same applies to the, so they do not invent, I mean, they, they, they don't have to invent the will. They're already there. And that's what the main idea of my presentation, that they're very serious about getting prepared for the war. And it means that uh, all, the whole variety of war, not only the military, but also the, in a nutshell, the answer to a question, the several strategic exercises had a portion of economy mobilization training. That's, that's the, the answer to the question. How we assess, they are preparing for the, the economy for the time of war. Even though there won't be war tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, but they are, they are serious and they spend some money on this because they, they see it as appropriate at that, at, at that the very moment, even though they, uh, they uh, put some efforts and uh, resources in the West, in the Southern West, but they clean forgot, clean forgot about the Chinese threat, actually, because you, you understand that the that far east of, of Russia is a Chinese, uh, and a lot of Chinese are settled there, so they, they would, we would argue that they would they have to look the other way, not the Western way, but they, they chose so. Thank you. Few, uh, few questions, but try to be concise. Well. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ryan Nabil, and I'm a graduate student in global affairs. Uh, given the growing Chinese interest in the Black Sea region, um, especially in Albania, for instance, I, I was wondering if you could tell us about the opportunities you see in China as a possible economic and military counterweight to Russia and Turkey. Hmm. Well, in my presentation, uh, when I mentioned the main players, I put a question mark on China. Um, China as I said, is the only country with global strategy nowadays. So they clearly are pushing west. Uh, but militarily, not yet. Right now we're talking about infrastructure projects, investment, purchases, uh, because many uh, Chinese companies acquired actually uh, some of the signature European companies in many sectors. Um, it's not only Albania. It's not only Albania. As I, as I mentioned, my country has been approached to be part of the Belt and Road Initiative. We said no for the time being. For the time being. Because the opportunities, the economic and financial uh, benefits from that cooperation uh, are there. Together with the benefits come some liabilities. And now it is the job of the policy makers and decision makers in each and every country to counter whether the benefits are more than the liabilities. Mm -hmm. In our case, we thought, we decided that the liabilities are more. The Italians decided otherwise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> military, mili there is no, there is no military cooperation uh, with China, uh, in my, to my humble knowledge, by any of the countries, literal countries uh, in the Black Region. So far, I know. Thank you. Your question, please. <clears throat> I have a question about, like, I was a little bit confused uh, by what you mean that uh, energy. Uh, security in Europe. So if Russians want to sell gas and building more pipes 
from my point of view, it make more reliable delivery of the gas to the Europe. If Macedonia doesn't have any other source of gas, why don't they buy our American liquid gas? Mm -hmm. So that would be diversified, right? The <coughs> gas sources. Uh, so what's wrong with building more pipes? Because from economical point of view, I think that's provide more security because you have more points of delivery of the gas. And if you don't have other sources, how else you can do it? Or if that gas is cheaper than yeah, liquid who, who gas, you Germany. want to force... Yeah, yeah. Who is sitting on this? Yeah. Uh, so can you just explain me? Uh, I will. Where is the security? <laughs> I will. I will. Now, look. The, it is interdependence. It is energy interdependence when we're talking about energy. And exactly gas, not oil. Gas. This is the thing. Now, Europe benefits by getting gas. Russia benefits by getting money. Everything is okay, right? Yes. But monopolism is not good. Yes. Monopolism is not good. That's why... Can you tell me why it is Russian policy to offer different prices, sometimes up to 50% higher or lower, to European countries? What is the rationale behind it? Uh, it's a market. Right? No, it's not. If you don't have no, it's not. Politics. It's exactly politics, politics you know? Yeah. It is leverage. It is leverage. It is pressure. It is pressure. And this is what we don't like. We, we love Russian gas. You know, there is a saying in Europe that in every basement in Europe, there is a Russian switching the heating on and off. <laughs> and that's true. The make themselves. Make yourself switching it on and off. You don't like Russian. We don't have the resources. It's Buy more expensive. It's oh, more expensive. So it's more expensive. So you don't like the price. No. Th that's a difference. No, 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 no. Don't, don't misunderstand me. Don't misunderstand me. They are alternatives. The thing is, they are alternatives from Azerbaijan, for example, right? And buy it from Azerbaijan. It is, it is coming. Now, we are working on it. We are diversifying both the suppliers and the transit roads. It's coming. Uh, right. Yeah, so we are working on this. But for the time being, the status quo is as I said. Yeah, but, but mm -hmm. then explain me what's wrong if you're going to buy... I, I guess it was others. explained that monopoly, because Russia price. wants to be price. supplier, it's the price. transitor, and Too distributor. Expensive. And how make it not monopoly? Because they actually taking that gas from whatever they're, they taking it. They want to be the supplier, the transitor, and distributor. This yeah. is what European Union is opposing together with those no, who depend. I depends. understand it. Okay, uh, we are we are pressed by the time. Can you can you can you push mm. monopolies, uh, which is which is. Uh, very Monopoly. challenging. Yeah, please. I want to thank the ambassador and the general. Very interesting presentations. Mm -hmm. uh, my question has to do with NATO. It seems to me, listening to the presentations, that NATO is largely to blame for the current situation and the buildup and the uh, activity of the Russian uh, Federation and the Russian forces in the Black Sea. Uh, you had plenty of warning. I'm talking about NATO. You had Georgia. You had the annexation of uh, Crimea, the forceful annexation. You have uh, NATO countries right on the Black Sea. Uh, Turkey had, as the ambassador mentioned, has a, a large military and a large uh, naval force also. And it seems that NATO could have been much more assertive at the outset. Um, even, you know, forget about Georgia, but certainly with the annexation of Crimea, the red flags were all over the place. And, uh, and the current situation in the Black Sea, I feel, is largely the result of lack of uh, NATO initiative to stabilize the situation, especially on the border of NATO countries. And so I'm happy to hear that um, NATO is finally taking a more active role, 
but uh, I'd like to hear your opinion about specifically what they could do militarily. I understand longer term values and the predominance of you know Western values may have an influence, but it seems short term there has to be some kind of uh, strong and very forceful uh, NATO response and even a NATO presence to at least stabilize the situation to prevent it from getting worse. And I'd like to hear your opinion about what NATO might be able to do. Okay, I, I can, I, <laughs> but we're not a member of NATO, so... Uh, I'll compliment. <laughs> okay. uh, actually, what I, what, uh, I would agree that uh, really it's not, uh, NATO is not blind, but it's more so slow, slow in response, and we are both of us probably heard about this uh, NATO uh, coming up with some some response as far as the Black Sea region, and I, I don't personally I don't know the specifics of that of that program, but uh, I would argue that they will probably need the presence naval presence in Black Sea, and as the uh, the ambassador alluded to this, that the Montreal Convention steps in. I mean. Turkey would, do, would probably, uh, uh, Russia will, uh, will certainly be opposed to, to any expansion of uh, naval presence, NATO naval presence in the Black Sea. Uh, on the other hand, what they do on the eastern flank, like in Poland, uh, in Romania, and uh, uh, for my country is good because we, what we try to get from NATO is that we, we, we try to explain to them that we'll do our, our part of job. Give us, give us the, the weapons. Give us uh, enough uh, 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 we're with we to, to oppose the, the aggression. Now, this, is, this is the main, uh, the main point of, of discussion between, between Ukraine and, uh, and NATO. And uh, uh, we already, there was an allusion to that uh, UN mission to Ukraine. I would like to uh, to pronounce it since it's uh, it's a, it's really growing understanding that there is no military way out of uh, uh, the conflict, international conflict. I would argue, and uh, in Ukraine, and this is the uh, the nexus of, of the, all this discussion, because we in this case NATO, if if it could have some some leverage. There was a, a mention of OCE as a revived, as a revived uh, abruptly revived because of that uh, of the conflict in Ukraine. So uh, I would argue that again, uh, what I tried to convey when I mentioned the values that without the values, because uh, if we are talking only capitalism, only the prices and the benefits, you would you would, you would forget the the benefits of values. If you put them aside, they will be used. They will be used by by the opponent of uh, those who cherish an, uh, other values. That's what was my point. But militarily, again, NATO unfortunately is a little bit slow, but it's, it takes time for for, for the NATO. That's uh, as, uh, the way I see it. Thank you. <coughs> well, uh, I'll be very concise. Uh, I'll try to at least. Uh, you know, uh, it is not that NATO uh, underestimated Russia. No, not at all. The geopolitical situation was different. Under the fall, after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, you remember we had that President Boris Yeltsin. Uh, he was uh, the best buddy with Bill Clinton, and the cooperation was uh, quite significant. At that time, Ambassador, I, I hope you would agree with me that uh, the Security Council of the United Nations for the first time started to work as a peace builder. Why? Because the two uh, powers, the two big powers, America and the Soviet Union and Russia, uh, they had good understanding between each other. That's why the Security Council of the United Nations started to function, to be a peace builder, which is actually uh, the purpose it has been created uh, for. Now, um, NATO did not underestimate Russia. The geopolitical situation was different. And after that, as I mentioned, the Russian Black Sea Fleet was not that powerful as it is today. And as it will be in a couple of years, because they are 
uh, commissioning uh, new vessels, new aircrafts, new weapons, everything. Uh, I'm not sure whether they have nuclear weapons there, but... Uh, no, they, they do not. Uh, as far not as yet. Crimea, they, not yet. <laughs> they have the capabilities to, to exactly. station them. Exactly. So the situation changed. And in this changed situation, I do remember the uh, Russian-Georgian war uh, from 2008. Uh, it was discussed at NATO. What sh can we do in the Black Sea? But at that time, there was no appetite to explore options how to increase NATO's presence in Black Sea. Because uh, Georgia has been considered an isolated case. That is not correct. That is not correct. <coughs> but it has been considered an isolated case. And the Montreal Convention, it is the convention. You cannot enter uh, the Black Sea uh, with a military ship and stay there, stay there longer than 45 days. So what can we do? Rotate ships? That is one option. The other option is the NATO littoral states, namely Turkey, Bulgaria, and Romania, to acquire sophisticated capabilities in the Black Sea, I mean uh, naval capabilities. Well, how to do that? We, Bulgaria, we had, we're very inventive, you know. We had that idea, we had that idea of the uh, so-called uh, uh, cascade uh, process. I mean, uh, for example, vessels decommissioned by the United States to be uh, given to us, mm -hmm. to, to, to use them. <laughs> but that idea somehow, for some reasons, uh, was not welcomed very much. Uh, and I agree that uh, this is not the best solution, but uh, mm -hmm. we must do something. I don't know what. What? We have to be inventive to think out of the box. I mentioned few of the options. They are on the table. One of them, or combination. Okay, it's the thank only you. way. Last question, and so. Thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a very important topic to increase the awareness among Ivy League schools. And my question is, um, I'm trying to look into the future, yes, so I'm very well aware of what is going on now or what was before several years ago. Mm -hmm. But we students here, sooner or later, we need to make a decision wh whether we mm -hmm. want to go back, whether we are going back actually to the Black Sea region. And what do you think about the perspective of the region? Uh, not only uh, I'm thinking about Ukrainian conflict, I'm thinking about Eastern, Central Europe and Western Europe as well, because overall situation there is not the best. So I would appreciate your thoughts. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. I'll, this time I'll be very concise. Very. Uh, uh, now, look, I'll share with you the dream of my prime minister, Boyko Borisov. His dream is that in the Black Sea, we should have a lot of tourists, uh, a lot of yachts, so <laughs> prosperity, uh, free movement, and pipelines. So uh, I really want, we'll work, work for that, that not to allow the Black Sea <coughs> region to turn into a zone of conflict. That's it. Thank you. Should I? Okay, I can react. I, I agree that it should be a plethora of touristic opportunities in my country and say in Ukraine and Crimea with uh, different tourists with no Russian presence, military presence. That's the future for, for my country. First of all, it's important to reconstruct the, the trust which is lost, totally lost. <coughs> to reconstruct the confidence. <coughs> so in the region there are a lot of institutions which were built and founded just to to have to have the confidence in the re confidence building i was a part of that when we uh, created the mm, black sea force uh, oh where yeah. we signed all this so long ago it was oh frozen yeah. but it, it was created just for the confidence uh, and many institutions of the kind mm. european union synergy projects there mm -hmm. is just about that mm. so uh, what is needed to come back to the mm, uh, to the trust which is lost totally lost. Well, thank you very much <coughs> for your questions, for attendance. Well, 
uh, all those who are <laughs> watching us <laughs> now, <Wow. coughs> uh, thank you to be with us today. <coughs> and all the best for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs>